This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jacinta Thompson, and I'm the Executive Director and Events and Exhibitions Producer for the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the Hawke Centre and the University of South Australia. In doing so, I take this opportunity to acknowledge that the University of South Australia is on the tr traditional country of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land, and we acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Kaurna people living today. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our event tonight as we hear from George Megliginis as he discusses his very richly insightful essay, Minority Report, The New Shape of Australian Politics. George, it's wonderful to have you back at the Hawke Centre. Thank you, as we, along with Tori Shepherd. So a warm welcome to you both. We're um, also very pleased to see so many of you here tonight, and I would especially like to welcome um, our council members and the enterprise leadership team from the University of South Australia. So George is an author and journalist with three decades experience in the media. The Australian Moment won the 2013 Prime Minister's Literary Award for Nonfiction and the two, 2000, I was about to say 212, 2012 Walkley Award for Nonfiction and formed the basis for the ABC documentary series, Making Australia Great. Tonight, George will be in conversation with journalist Tori Shepherd. So, without further ado, <laughs> please welcome. Hi, everyone. It's fantastic to see so many faces here. Great to be here with you, George. So, I thought it was kind of serendipitous that we have you here today on the last sitting day of federal parliament. There's been lots going on. I was thinking I'd catch you all up on everything that happened today, but it's still unfolding. But I did want to just read you three of the top headlines from The Guardian today. Albanese government plan to raise tax on super balances over three million, all but abandoned. Albanese kills off deal with Greens to pass nature positive legislation. And Hanson alleging payment in breach of section 44 ends with Thorpe giving the finger. <laughs> Just thought that was a nice overview of what's happening in parliament at the moment. And then I thought I'd take you to an audience question first. And the first question we had from the audience, which they said was meant jokingly, was, is it time for a revolution? <laughs> Count me out in was that line in the, uh, in the Beatles song. You can count me out in. We sort of had the revolution at the last federal election. Uh, just sort of wind you back, not so much to the detail of the election, but the politics that we had up until that point was a duopoly that was steadily losing market share. Now, what we mean by duopoly, obviously, is especially since the end of the Second World War with the formation of the modern Liberal Party, which Robert Menzies led uh, at its inception, uh, you've had a two-party system where through the 50s and 60s, around 90% of the combined primary vote belonged to the two major parties. And when there was a change of government, there'd be about a five percentage point swing in the primary vote from one side to the other, and the incoming government had 50% of the primary vote. And then the Australian Electoral Commission actually acknowledged this point a while ago when they counted back the two-party preferred vote. They didn't even worry about the two-party preferred vote at a national level because the contest was between the two sides. Now, duopolies are a very Australian thing. Obviously, we're in Adelaide, we're in one half of the, we're below the Barassi line, so we're in one half of duopoly in terms of our culture. We've got two footy codes, you know, two major supermarket chains, two globally significant mining companies. The Noah's Ark of democracy. <laughs> <laughs> well put. <laughs> The thing, about, the thing about the last federal election, the last federal election because of the arrival of the Teals and the increasing number of Greens, there were three of them elected at once in Brisbane of all places, which you think is a more conservative outpost in Australia, 
Uh, the arrival of that much larger crossbench, and for South Australians, of course, you're familiar with independence, uh, and you're familiar with independence at the state at the federal level, but the arrival of such a big crossbench um, changed the numbers game in politics almost permanently. And the idea that when you get a change of government, you get a handover, in a sense, of authority with the incoming government sitting on a reasonable majority, which acts as a buffer for the second term, because you know, they get a swing against them, but they got a few seats they could afford to lose. That didn't happen at the last election. The last election, the coalition lost in a landslide. Now, by landslide, how do you measure that? Well, their seat count at the end of the election was their lowest chair of the parliament on record for the modern Liberal Party. That was one part of it. The other part of it was for the first time for the modern Liberal Party, they are outnumbered by National Party MPs and the LNP in Queensland in the lower house. So an epic eviction of, a, of one part of the duopoly, uh, especially an epic eviction in Melbourne, Sydney and Perth and to a lesser extent in Brisbane. So that looks like a revolution on paper, but of course the incoming government uh, seized the capital, but they arrived with no guns. So they... <laughs> not, not that anyone's promoting that kind of activity well, in no, this country. John Howard thinks, <laughs> oh, well, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to change the government and Labor, Labor uh, had no shots to fire on arrival. The Labor Party, remember, uh, just got a two-seat majority with a primary vote of just under... 33%. Remember they always used to say you can't win unless there's a four in front of it? Right. Well, there was a three in front of everyone at the last election. That was the point. So there's been a net swing to uh, minor parties and independents in each federal election since 2007. So 210, 213, 216, 219, and 222 is really the tipping point where the none of the above vote crosses 30%. So the question about the revolution, we've had it. It was televised, for those of you who remember that song as well. This is... It was live streamed. It was definitely televised and nothing happened. The parliament itself seemed to revert to a duop a form of, uh, another form of duopoly, which is, without getting too deep into the weeds about the Albanese versus Dutton contest, do you notice how quickly the microphone went back to the opposition leader, even though the opposition leader had fewer seats than any liberal leader in history? in the parliament. The microphone went straight back to the opposition leader. The crossbench in the lower house uh, was counted out of most legislative equations because Labor had a majority, which was increased by one sort of Aston by-election. The Senate looked completely different to the rest of the country anyway because it, uh, it was scrambled even before five of them changed parties. <laughs> By the way, count them, five senators since the last election have changed the party they were elected. It's been for. very dynamic. Dynamic is a good word for it. Um, is it time for a revolution? As I said, we've had one. Uh, but the interesting thing for me is how inert the joint has been since the revolution. And part of that is the absence of a, of a majority that Labor feels confident to be able to govern off. And the other part of it is that the parliament itself hasn't quite registered what the electorate told them at the last election. The two parts of the same story. The electorate administered a shock, a historic shock on the federal parliament at the last election by breaking the two-party system. So we didn't ask a, if, haven't asked this question yet, but is the duopoly dead? Officially it oh, is. Oh, do, do you want me to put, write that? Do yeah. you want me to ask you is that? Is the duopoly dead? Oh, oh, so, sorry, it's George, George, is, is the duopoly dead? Okay, ask yourself this question. <laughs> um, do you expect a net swing to, uh, to the major parties at the next federal election based on the way they performed in this term, right? So that none of the above vote, other things being equal, is going to rise again, which creates all sorts of... Also, it has all sorts of consequences for our system going forward. Um, you may get a situation a term or two from now where one of the major parties gets a fallback in front of their primary vote and they have an epic win and the other side has got a two in front of their primary vote, but you've still got more than a third of the people voting none of the above. So it's a long way of saying that we've had a revolution, but nothing happened yet. <laughs> so is that a good thing? Because my reading was that you went from sort of thinking a a hung parliament particularly is not a, not a good thing, a majority would be better, to actually thinking maybe this diversity that we've got in the crossbench might not be the terrible thing yeah. that everybody thinks. So is that right? And also, is that because we used to think of the 
crossbench is kind of the the La Cantina scene from Star Wars was the classic yeah, analogy. Yeah, hostage like, takers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whereas now it's, I would say, a more thoughtful, considered, centrist mob. So the, the thing I'm still toying with in my head is what would a good hung parliament look like and what would a terrible hung parliament look like and then weigh the risks. And a lot of it's based on personality. Uh, and then weigh the risks of what it would mean for the country. I, when the electorate sees it, how would the electorate respond to it? So the last election, even though we elect a you know, narrow majority Labor government, uh, we do something and we do have a very simple comparison. And uh, most people will look to opinion polls and read them the way they want to read them. But we've had back-to-back -back an Australian election in 2022 where a long-term coalition government with multiple prime ministers uh, suffers an epic loss and the Labor Party win the election with a primary vote of under 33%. We just had the same thing repeated in the UK. Uh, Conservative government with probably one or two more prime ministers than we had because they end up breaking our record. Uh, they, get, they suffer an epic loss. The Labor Party, although in their case, because they've got a first-past-the-post system and voluntary voting, uh, their primary vote of around 33% translates to a landslide. But of course, a couple of months after, after they win, people have been showing, poll, showing you polls that Keir Starmer's approval rating is um, alongside Nigel Farage's in the toilet. So he's had, he's, he didn't even have a honeymoon and shh, down it went. We won't get too deep into the British story, but the fact that the two systems have done a not dissimilar thing in turfing out a Conservative government, but in a post-duopoly setup where the Labor Party comes in with a third of the primary vote. So in the UK, of course, you get a majority government. In Australia, uh, we get a narrow majority for the Labor Party. In the UK, what happened to the Conservative vote is the thing that interests me, because obviously when you chuck out a government, what do you want your parliament to look like after you've chucked out your government? Well, some of that Conservative vote clearly went to the Labor Party because the Labor Party picked up a lot of seats off the Tories. But a lot of that Conservative vote in the UK uh, went to the right. It went to the right of the Conservative Party and Nigel Farage himself actually got into the House of Commons. So he calls his party now Reform, I think it is. It used to be UKIP, now it's called Reform. Um, Reform is kind of like a word, if you used it here, it'd be like, oh, I wish we could have some. <laughs> <laughs> it's meant to be an inherently good thing, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a bit like liberal in Australia, right? You take liberal into the, into the, US, in the US marketplace and they go, you're telling me you're conservative? <laughs> you're calling yourself a liberal? Anyway, be that as it may. So using, using the UK example and, and in a sense counting back to the last federal election, Clive Palmer spends over 100 million bucks at the last election. So Clive Palmer spends, uh, spends the equivalent on per capita basis of what Elon Musk and co have done for Trump at the is it, a, is it the same per capita? Fascinating. Yeah. yeah. He's, 100, he's 100 million on their system, to our mm. system is mm. essentially it's quantum because they're, they're, they're billion dollar enterprises mm. now. By the way, the Americans are stuck with their two party system because there isn't a cap on uh, financial Oh, just, they don't even have a disclosure regime, but basically there's, the sky's the limit in terms of the funding of politics. So the barrier to entry for a third force in their system is impossibly high because it's money. Anyway, Clive Palmer, long story short, Clive Palmer gets to, gets to test this thesis. Um, did the Australian people smash the system at the last election in the way the Brits have obviously just smashed their system now twice? through Brexit and by destroying the Conservative Party and then going further to the right. Well, we know that that isn't what happened. Uh, poor old Clive didn't get Craig Kelly to become Prime Minister. <laughs> uh, he got a single senator in Victoria, and that seems to be uh, uh, unusual in itself, but there was a bit of an anti-vax sort of lockdown fatigue story happening in the outer suburbs in Melbourne, and that's, that's where he got up. The... Liberal vote collapses at the last federal election. The National Party vote, by the way, held up. Liberal Party collapses at the last election, but it didn't go to Palmer. Some of it did, you know, in the crisscross. It didn't go substantially to Palmer. It went back to the centre, and this is really where the teals came. Now, in fact, when I think about SA's political history and the Liberal movement in Steel Hall, you've almost predicted 50 years out what it looks like at a national level if a Conservative Party gets too far off centre too far off centre-right, too far to the right, 
you get smashed in the you get smashed in the capitals, which is what happened in the last election. So the Australian electorate in 2022, but it's an open question how they'll react if they actually get a hung parliament. The Australian election in 2022 was trying to force a change on the system, and it's looking at both side, both main parties and say, look, I don't care which one of you in the long run governs, uh, but you should be listening to Allegra Spender rather than to Clive Palmer. The next Tory government in the UK, if they're going to have one, they probably will have one. The Labor Party looks like it's trying to blow its brains out in its first six months in Britain. Um, that that party is going to have to ha come to some agreement with with um, the party to their right. See, John Howard didn't even have this problem with Hanson, mm. which was 20-something years ago, a completely different electoral demography. Now it's almost impossible to conceive of a situation where... There'll be all these, all these independents turning up to the hard right, forcing the next coalition government to go, to go completely native in terms of their... The people of Australia are trying, to, are trying to steer the libs back to the centre, but the people of Australia are also for the Labor Party, are trying to radicalise them, they are trying to get them to govern, they are trying to get them to do things with power. And that's quite an interesting equation to get from your population. It's not, it, intuitively, it's a very, very good read. Labor are too timid, coalition are a little too wacky. And so we'll send you as many <laughs> cross benches as we possibly can to drag you, drag you both back to a problem solving centre. So scenarios for hung parliament, mm. the best one, the dream one is, and it doesn't matter who, who's in power, the dream one is that the teals and regional independence between them have enough numbers collectively to be able to force who is ever in power uh, to go to them each time to do big things. Mm. And then once it's passed the lower house to pretty much create a you know, moral pressure on the Senate to figure out a way to get it through, even if the numbers in the Senate don't reflect the numbers in the lower house, i.e. that the crossbench in the Senate is a completely different confederation of crossbench in the lower house. That's your dream scenario. And it becomes a dream scenario in two ways. And I'm trying to be super optimistic here. The microphone does not belong to the opposition leader at that point. Because the person who's got minority government plus the crossbenches are the people that you're going to be interested in. And you've got to be interested in one thing and one thing only. Did they, did they get anything done today? Not what the other side is saying, you're all hopeless, nothing's happening, vote for me and I won't tell you how I'm going to pay for it. That style of politics ideally uh, would, 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 um, would well, won't necessarily disappear, but you you incentives in media and your incentives in lobbying and your incentives in just all the discussions that are had around politics are the minority government plus the crossbench. The maths, the eternal maths. Uh, now, the, um, now the scenario at the other end, which is informed by what we've already seen in the Senate, is that there are a whole lot of ego trippers and narcissists and people with legitimate gripes and people for, for whatever reasons, health reasons or whatever, um, leave early and there's a by-election, that the numbers on the floor become so unmanageable and you get two things going on at once for the governing party, either the minority party. They're terrified about the person at the extreme end of their party room and they're also terrified of not just people crossing the floor but the silent, um, those I changing sides or going independent or going rogue, the, the sort of scenario in between it where they just turn, to forget to turn up for a particular vote or they do a Bridget Archer, which she's just done, and just cross the floor. Mm -hmm. So you don't even need to set yourself up in an independent or cross bench at that point because each individual on the back bench knows that their numbers can completely turn the system on its head to your advantage. And, of course, some constituents would say, hooray. But I think voters would say, no, no, this isn't what I bargain for. Mm. I don't think Australians will go to the next election wanting a hung parliament, but the way, the way the system seems set up at the moment and the way each of the major parties have reacted to the story of 2022 is we're more likely than not to get one. I'm not making this a prediction, by the way, but the, the, the thinking is around what the next one will look like. And the next one is going to be probably more interesting than the last one because the last one had a very, very narrow cast crossbench. There were five guys, four of them propped up the Gillard government and Tony Abbott just went, no, 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 all the way through it. 
As I say, I think that's... They did get a surprising amount through, though, didn't they? They got a lot yeah. through, but they got a lot through for reasons that a lot of us even have to remind myself. Um, Gillard signed essentially a coalition agreement. It wasn't really a coalition mm. agreement. And the Greens had the balance of power in their own right in the Senate. But that gave the Greens an inordinate amount of power to get their agenda through off the back of the Labor agenda. So price on carbon, even though it had been ruled out before the election, uh, becomes national policy. Uh, Malaysian people swap? No. Not our agenda. Can't be your agenda. And remember, when you think about the Australian Democrats here, obviously a big cluster of votes for Australian Democrats here. Uh, Janine Haynes and obviously Natasha Dossboy, both South Australians who led the Democrats at one point. They were conceived in the Don Chip days as a party to hold a government to account and to keep the system honest, to keep the bastards honest. So it wasn't our platform says X, Y and Z, their platform says something else and when we go to negotiate we rule out what they've been elected for and we'll just impose our agenda. That's essentially the way the Greens operate. The Democrats were all about improving government legislation and stopping things that, that the government hadn't promised. So the blocking power came if you were doing something you hadn't told the people about. That's not the scenario we'd be looking at in a crossbench, whatever your configuration of crossbench. At the moment, I think because both sides are essentially delegitimised by the three in front of their primary votes, and Labor Party at the moment has got, a, has got a two in front of theirs on some polls, and Gillard was at that point, remember, in the middle of the minority government was one of the reasons why they rolled her in the end. Um, was that when we saw the real Julia? Was the real that Julia? Point? No, no, that she was. She came out in the second week of the election campaign. God, was that early? She still had a three in front of her primary vote in the election <laughs> campaign, but she was going to lose it at that point. I don't know how you keep all this stuff in your head. Um, and I want to come back to the Greens. Sorry, yeah, yeah. So, so but just on that, so think about this is, we'll go back to the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is because the two major parties got a three in front of it, and we don't have a habit of minority government. This is in Europe, obviously, which is routine. Um, so the crossbench is going to feel like they had a separate mandate a mandate in a sense that works above the government that gets elected. And that's, that, that to me is problematic. Mm. And I'm not sure that the electorate is ready for that part, of, that part of the scenario. Whilst we can think about how wonderful it is we broke a duopoly, um, it'd be good to see you know, Coles and Woolies held to account, but at some point, if the next shop that opens... Are we is, fans of Aldi though, yeah, really? Exactly. <laughs> Um, I do want to come back to the Greens, but first of all, I wanted to ask you, because I think one of the things that you've done wonderfully in this essay is a sort of a bird's eye view and a historical view, but then also a bit of a subterranean look at some of the strategy behind what happens. What do you think about the more extreme elements within the coalition? Do you think they keep some of them there? I'm thinking of your sort of your like antics and people like that as a, like a pressure valve to kind of keep those people in, because then it seems that the, that strategy then removes the possibility of people like Allegra Spender running for the Liberals. So, yeah, so you know, this is so you you need to you need to understand that Liberal Party is still a bit more of a state divisions and a and a national leader hmm. operation in terms of their structure. They're not as they're not as sort of organised as Labor is historically, and up until. Up until recently, they were never very comfortable in opposition because they're a very leader-based party and uh, as soon as they lose an election, that leader then ends up voting for somebody else at the next election. You know, Even when after Menzies retired, he didn't give his first preference to John Gorton's um, Liberal Party in the 69 election, I've been told, by someone who was there, weirdly. Um, Gorton then goes independent. Fraser, of course, where did Malcolm end up? He ended up with the Greens, I think. Did he end up with the Greens or he was going to form his own political party? But, you know, they had that history. Um, since the Hanson shock, there's been, this, there's been this fear in the Liberal Party that there's another Pauline in the party room who will, who will be more, more efficient than Pauline was at, A, getting movement around her, but, B, then getting seats, mm -hmm. i.e. the UKIP reform scenario, the Farage scenario. And uh, so that's one reason why they try and keep him in the tent. But the other reason they keep him in the tent 
and this is, goes more to survival institutes, I think their survival institutes have been dulled a bit by, by their ability to squeeze out a couple of election results, 2016 and 2019, which basically turned on super majorities in Queensland and WA. And the Labor Party, and this is an unusual thing when you think about it, a Labor Party is led by Bill Shorten in those two elections, who's a Melbourneian, who feels like a Melbourneian and also a union official. And the Liberal Party are led by first Malcolm Turnbull and then Scott Morrison in those two elections. And Shorten's Labor Party win a majority of seats in Sydney both times. But because the Coalition has won those two elections, it hasn't logged the existential threat that's looming in the cities for them, which is essentially Allegra Spender, Zali Stegall, um, and by the time you get to Brisbane, um, uh, you know, a couple of junior woodchucks who are very good at organising on the ground. So they keep them in the tent because the fear of uh, losing the right flank, but you're mm -hmm. right, they haven't been keeping an eye on what it is. Because they've that, made the tent a more unpleasant place and now the other people don't want to well, be in the So tent. they haven't... They, They've assumed that the electorate sort of understands the pragmatic reasons why you're keeping the tent, whereas the electorate are looking at them and thinking, well, you guys are way to the right of me and you're way to the right of any previous Liberal government I've voted for. Mm. And remember, those teals uh, turn up at once and suddenly all those seats fell at once, which is not the, your traditional experience of independence. Seven moved, if you count the one that went against Labor, which is Fowler, to um, Dai Li. But six went, and in fact, if they'd been more organised, they would have picked off a couple in Brisbane as well, because they didn't stand any candidates in Brisbane. And if they had a decent candidate in Higgins, they would have got one of them as well. They could have got up to 10. I mean, no Sturt could have fallen. And it's possible that another couple will turn up at the next federal election. So that was a long time coming, but it happens all at once because at that last federal election, Scott Morrison thinks, I've got one more supermajority in Queensland that I could use to squeeze out one more narrow victory. They used to talk about goat track, remember? Yeah. On the coalition Yeah, you had Andrew Hurst, the kind of strategy guy, sitting in a room just plotting, you know, if we get that Tasmanian seat here and if we get this yeah. one here, it's, yeah, it's yeah, very, but very micro. But obviously the country doesn't, the country intuitively has never looked like that party room. But now after that last election, that party room, as I mentioned earlier, the Liberal Party of Robert Menzies, the urban middle class based Liberal Party that built bridge between, um, you know, the leafy suburbs and, and rural and regional Australia, that party, which is a conception of Menzies at a time when, you know, only Adelaide, Perth and Melbourne have a majority of the population of their respective states. So this is, this is a city country party, that the Liberals themselves are a city country party with the country party as their coalition partner. They're now the majority of the... Of, of, they're, they're now the minority, sorry, on the, in the party room. Uh, the LNP, which is Dutton's party, where the super majority is, is in charge. And, the, you know, the party formerly led by Barnaby Joyce has an ex, uh, another 10 seats in the lower house and that's, and they didn't lose one at the last election. So when you're asking about some of the people on the fringes, they're actually a lot closer to what the party room looks like now than mm. it looks like to us looking from the outside. So it's harder to recognise them as a threat when you're kind of a bit like them, but maybe not as crazy. So I think that that's... Is it Barnaby Joyce we're talking about here? Not necessarily <laughs> Barnaby. It's a, it, literally, it's a, it's a composition issue. It's a composition issue. The, if, if your party room isn't diverse enough... And by the way, if you're looking at a party room now that has decided to write off the teal seats, mm -hmm. so their strategy is to forget the teal seats because we, we, had a, we had a little experiment with The Voice to see whether, whether those teal seats would just revert once to sort of what Dutton was asking, which is to vote no, and then they all voted yes. All of them. So, and then he saw that and he thought, well, I got a no there, but I got a lot of, oh, sorry, I got a yes there, but I got a lot of no's in Labor seats. So I've been looking at the Labor seats. Mm. So again, that comes back to, so why would, why would you keep them all in the tent? Maybe that is their tent. Maybe that's who, they, that's who they've become. And it's, um, and inside that tent, you've decided to write off the capital cities and you think there are more seats like yours, which you already hold, there for the taking. And um, after the last election, Arthur Sinodinus, remember, he was John Howard's chief of staff, subsequently an ambassador to Washington. 
and Jane Hume, who's a senator from Victoria, were tasked with the post-election review. And a couple of zingers in that review. Uh, one was aimed at Dutton about the role he played in alienating uh, conservative Chinese Australians and turning them into Labor voters. There was a very, very pointed reference to that in there, which he's logged and he understands. But the other one was you cannot write off in a metropolitan Australia because there simply aren't enough seats to win majority government from the regions. So it's in black and white in, in, in terms of their, in terms of their uh, post-election review. But inside that party room, which is now where the urban-based MPs are in the minority, uh, they're essentially asking people in that party room to prioritise seats like theirs, which would then change the composition of that party room. This is a power trip, right? It would then change that composition of the party room, even if it comes with government. It comes with government, but your faction is not going to get to enjoy government. So. I've seen this movie once before, and that was the Labor Party, uh, especially in Victoria, when they decided it was better to be pure and as Trotskyist as they possibly could be in Victoria in the 50s and 60s after the split, and they were quite happy to lose elections because they thought the day that they won with their very, very radicalised government, which would involve a very radicalised government, they got to change the state in their own name as if the rest of the state would sort of cop it. They just never got the chance because people kept saying no to them. And I wonder whether that possibility exists for the coalition, regardless of what happens at the next election, that at some point there'll have to be a penny drop about the almost implausibility mathematically of trying to govern Australia from Barnaby Joyce's electorate, for example. Yeah. Do you have a, you mentioned the voice and Peter Dutton looking at the nose. Um, and obviously things changed very quickly when it came to the referendum. And I think people also, the sort of sense that, well, the gay marriage vote went this way, so we are, we are bending more progressive, progressive so yeah. there should be you know, a bit of complacency snuck in. How do, you, how do you track that, I guess, from the gay marriage to the referendum? Is it the individual context of those votes? or is something happening in terms of the way the country's swinging? Yeah, I think um, the marriage equality debates uh, an interesting one because remember it's a postal vote so it's a, technically a plebiscite but the conscription referenda which we refer to referenda they were plebiscites as well so it's voluntary not compulsory. Now a voluntary vote if a voluntary vote had been held in 99 uh, the exit polling suggests that the ANU ran some exit polling at the time uh, that the Republic would have got up. That a lot of no's just wouldn't have turned up the don't cares wouldn't have turned up and the Republic would have got up, which is a very interesting thought experiment to run if it had just been a plebiscite, but obviously it had to be a referendum. Uh, I've gone back to the to 99, then looked at 2017, then overlaid 2023. So what I've done is basically used each of those referenda as a social x-ray and plonked one on top of the other to see what is changing in Australia in the last 20-something years? Because it's easy to... The headline observation about the end of the duopoly, well, what's beneath that? Mm. And rather than do the thing that everybody else was doing, which is sort of have a look at a partial pop data piece here, interview a couple of people there, um, let's put three actual votes on top of each other and see what part of that story informs the end of the duopoly. It's really crying out for graphic visualisation, by the way. It is, except I've got long arms, so I will try, <laughs> especially for those watching on the live stream, I'll try and give you a sense of what it was telling us. So can, I, can I start, because I know you've asked me about marriage equality, can I start in 99? Yeah, yeah, take it back, go. So 99 is interesting when you do it by electorate. Uh, the national vote's obviously 55-45 for the status quo. The exit polls at the time told us that the majority of the no vote, I bit over 30, 30 percentage points of that 55 are actually Republicans who preferred a direct election. And so the Republicans outnumbered monarchists in the no camp. And obviously John Howard would think he's a genius for having split the yes vote, which he did. But there was still a, uh, a story to be told about the location of the yes vote and how it related to the no vote across the country. And other things being equal, the further you got away from the CBD in each capital city, the lower the yes vote and the higher the no vote. The highest yes vote is in the electorate of Melbourne, 
And the lowest yes vote of 99 is Maranawa, which is um, now David Littleproud's seat, which is outback Queensland. Now that polarity between inner city Melbourne and outback Queensland repeats during the voice. So they're the two, they're the two highest and lowest. There's a good top line observation to make, but there's a swing from yes to no. So the yes vote, the yes vote during the referendum in outback Queensland is in the low 20s or 30s, and it's only 15% for the voice. So there's like a swing away. It's less progressive, if that makes sense. If we use the two, I'll get to marriage equality in a sec. So, so at the top and the bottom of the distribution for yes and no, there's a swing away. There's a swing to no the further you get out compared to 99. Now, in Maranoa, there's actually um, a good historical reason to think long and hard about why that's always been the no centre in Australia, the most conservative part of Australia. It's the site, unfortunately, of two of the biggest documented um, Aboriginal massacres. And it's also, weirdly, from the Labor perspective, one of the contested birthplaces for the Labor movement at Bar Calder. So that electorate contains both those stories. Mm -hmm. So the Labor movement, which we know going into Federation, is blue collar but white Australia. And also there's a lot of tears were shed, a lot of blood was shed in that area too. So the relationship, relationship that, that area's relationship with the rest of Australia and the question of who we are as Australians, when you think about inner city Melbourne, what is inner city Melbourne? Inner city Melbourne is the entry port to the, um, to the gold rush to the 1850s, big democratic surge there. And it's also from the post-war migration program, uh, program onwards, the most ethnically diverse but cohesive part of Australia as well. So just using that as your, as your sort of top and bottom, when I, when I checked these votes, and it's quite interesting, it struck me that the swing away told me one thing about how regional Australia is feeling less connected to the cities than it ever has. So that's one point of the story. But the other part of the story, and this is where it re the detail gets really fascinating in the cities themselves, because the cities themselves are changing really quickly. There's a swing to, yes, the closer you get to the CBD compared to 1999. So even though the voice is tanked in a major way, like there's across the country, there's a 5% shift from the yes vote for the referendum for a republic, 45, to, four, to just below 40 for the voice. So if you use five as your baseline, there's a net swing of net, uh, net minus five across the country. There's like plus six to 10% in Melbourne for the voice, right? So the voice, the voice has, has, has triggered more, more cosmopolitan unity than the republic did. But the gap between the top and the bottom, that makes your gap between the top and the bottom widen. Now within the cities, so I said I was gonna flag Republic and then we'll get to mm -hmm. marriage equality. So within the cities, you had Melbourne as a majority yes city in both referenda, but a number of seats that voted yes in 99 vote no in 2023, even though the inner city is even more progressive than it was 20 odd years ago. All those electorates are increasingly ethnically diverse. So they are labour, safe labour strongholds in the north, northwest, and the south of Melbourne, uh, deep south of Melbourne, to be deep southeast, um, and they are more ethnically diverse than they were 25 years ago, but they are very socially conservative. So how do we know this? That's why marriage equality in between those two is the proper signal to look at. And I'll switch from Melbourne to Sydney. Sydney is a majority yes seat in 1999. Strangely, though, John Howard puts the referendum and he wants it to fail, but his seat votes yes, as does the rest of the city on average. Paul Keating, who's no longer there, but he's the reason why we're having this referendum. Blacksland votes no against. <laughs> so I always view this as, as the, the, the almost most sublime expression of Australian contrarianness. <laughs> that Keating gets, a, Keating gets a no for the, for the Republic in his, in his own seat and Howard gets a yes, the monarchist. <laughs> Um, but Sydney, Sydney is majority but divided. It's, it's majority S in 99. All of Western Sydney, bar Fowler, by the way, all of Western Sydney, which is all safe Labor territory, voted no in 1999. In 2023, Sydney's moved from a majority S to majority no. And in fact, the yes belt is really, really contained in and around Sydney Harbour. So any electric with a harbour view or a water view as you go further north, 
and I'm not kidding, any electorate with a Harbour View has voted yes. Every other electorate that does not have a Harbour View, <laughs> every other electorate has voted no. Not this only news recorded in that ABS data somewhere <laughs> that you can do the breakdown. We can, we, we, we can figure out. Yeah, I know. So if we're still at, we're, if we're both still at News Limited, and I pitched this story to head office. I would say, right, find me, find yeah. me the booth where the transition from yes to no is, and they can still see the water. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. send it, send it. Poor, some yeah. poor young cadet would have to be sent out there to point a microphone a couple of people. Well, the people. undecided voter who's only got a sliver of a view if you stick your head out the window and see whether they go on and on. So, and I've, I've done this by analogy because train journeys are always the best analogy as you go through electorate. So if you start at Central Station and you're heading, um, you're heading to Bankstown. So you're basically going through the, into the deep west of Sydney. So you're heading into you're heading into Labor Territory. You're starting in Labor Territory, and you'll remain in Labor Territory. But these are two Australians as you go from the inner city of Sydney to the western suburbs. Um, the no vote rises about ten points at each at each change of electorate. So the Plebiscite and Albanese electorates have got really really high yes votes. But as soon as you cross, as soon as you sort of turn west at Marrickville Station. And you're heading into um, uh, Tony Burke's seat and Jason Clare's seat. Uh, the no vote is going dink, dink, dink. Now, why are we flagging marriage equality early? Because you already know the answer to this question, but you're going to make me sound like I've come up with the answer in conversation. Really, right? like, that's it. It's all just questions without notice, and you're yeah, just pulling yeah. us all straight out of that magnificent brain. So, 99 to 2023 is really interesting story. So, why is the inner city becoming more progressive, and why are the outer suburbs becoming less progressive? Well, what's driving the population in those two parts of the capitals are two different things. One's internal migration, which is gentrification of the inner city. There's a whole lot of yuppies moved back in. And not just yuppies, by the way, second, third generation kids who, with, with migrant parents or grandparents, going back to the old working class suburbs to pay a couple of million bucks for a place that their parents fled from in the 60s and 70s because they wanted to get out to Doncaster or they wanted to get out to the Hills District of Sydney or whatever. You know, so they got two garages and a garden and, and uh, you know, a, a foe. Uh, uh, Parthenon erected in the front yard and, uh, <laughs> and the Italians would get their water features going and uh, all the little statues of David and this is social phenomena, right? And Adelaide's probably going to start to see a version of this as well, except the Greeks never left Adelaide from what I understand. Um, so the inner cities are gentrifying. They're actually becoming wider than they were even 10 years ago. And this is the second fastest growing part of the capitals. The fastest growing part are the outer suburbs. And the outer suburbs is, are dominated by migrants and their kids. Mm -hmm. And let's go back to Sydney's West, because Sydney's West is where it gets really, really intriguing. So Parramatta at the moment, uh, any ABC people in the room? So, you know, the ABC is sort of now projecting onto Parramatta, the real Sydney, and they're trying to send a whole lot of people up there. It's caused some angst. It's caused some angst, but across, across the media, so. Tori and I have got old News Limited pedigree, and we all know Mine's what... Mine's not quite as old as yours. Yeah, yes. I know, but we've all got that. I know, I'm, I'm on my seniors tour, right? So <laughs> he's literally first, on his seniors tour, the, he's the, calling it. I'm calling it the seniors tour, right, because I don't play open grade anymore. My first book was published 21 years ago, so that, I think this qualifies as a seniors tour. <laughs> um, uh, our head office, Holt Street, in Sydney and Surrey Hills, a couple of minutes by foot to Central Station, Ultimo at the ABC, a couple of minutes by foot to Central Station, and the old Fairfax on Broadway, a couple of minutes by foot to Central Station. The least representative but most powerful three major organisations in the country all live within a kilometre of each other, and they think that real Sydney is a train line, a 20-minute train ride to the Qantas Lounge. <laughs> it's occurred to each of them as their market share has diminished that most of the growth in Sydney is out in the West, where real Sydney is. So now they just think, right, let's go over there and see what these blue collar battler rugby league supporters are all thinking out there. And they turn up there and they, they find, to their, to their um, shock, two things. One, it's not like they imagined it, obviously, because it's not as wide as they imagined it would be, because they thought this is Jones, Alan Jones territory, struggle town, it's not. In Parramatta, and I use Parramatta as a bit of an example, across Sydney, Two-thirds, so 67% of Sydney's population across the entire city is either a migrant 
or has at least one migrant parent. So born overseas or, or with one migrant parent, first and second generation adds up to 67% of the population. Adelaide's, by the way, is just over 51%. It's around 50-51%. So that's just to give you an idea of what Sydney as a whole looks like. In Parramatta, it's 90%. And the entirety of their population growth is coming from the migration program. And in fact, Sydney, Sydney is radically changing its ethnic face because their property market is spitting out a whole lot of... They lose about 20,000 people a year from Sydney in net terms to in, interstate migration. And they tend on average to be whiter than the city at large. So the city gets more diverse because their old Australian population is shrinking in absolute terms. Um, it happens in country towns for different reasons because of ageing. Um, but in Sydney, it's happening because people are getting priced out. But by the way, ten, five, ten years later, migrant communities start to exit Sydney at the same rate as the local born do, because property being what it is. But in the West, led by Indian migration, because that's the, that's the dominant wave of the 21st century, the second part of that wave for Sydney, obviously, Chinese migration, when we looked at the uh, 2017 uh, plebiscite, and this is even before you go to the sort of their sort of their anchor diversity in Western Sydney, which is um, Middle Eastern, Arab, and Muslim populations from from the 70s and 80s in takes, and Vietnamese as well. So when you look at when you look at the marriage equality debate, do you remember the vote was just under 62 percent? Yes, every state votes yes. Only a dozen or so electorates vote no out of 151. And something like nine or ten of those dozen electorates are in the one spot, Western Sydney. So it's less of a surprise that Western Sydney delivers its, its third no vote. But what's more interesting about the consequence of the no vote for The Voice is that the no campaign late in the piece started to hit hard the disinformation campaign in non-English speaking communities and got a payoff that I think and they will never own up to it, but it got a payoff that they probably didn't expect. The tracking polls, and there were more polls than you ever needed to look at for the voice. The tracking polls, when the national vote tipped below 50, there were really only three groups that were still voting yes at that point. It was younger Australians with a tertiary degree, Aboriginal and Torres Strait, and the younger Australians obviously living in the inner city, and we know those electorates ended up voting yes. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands, of course, that they had the highest yes vote of any cohort in Australia, and on English speaking, and, and um, voters uh, where a language other than English was spoken at home. The final quarter, when the game was already lost, the final quarter, the new Australian vote for the voice collapses when the disinformation campaign runs, and it collapses in quite a dramatic way. And it's the reason why the national vote got, tugged below, got dragged below 40%. For Peter Dutton, who thinks there's a path to power uh, that ignores the teal seats, which all voted yes for the voice, um, he's actually been shown through the voice referendum and previously the marriage equality um, uh, plebiscite that the cities themselves, whilst you tend to view cities as, as sort of cosmopolitan entities and diverse entities, Within that diversity, there are very, very socially conservative electorates towards the outer suburbs. So he's looking at them through that lens. He's also trying, you know, an anti he's also trying to play an anti-immigration card at the same time and hope that the migrants accept it. Um, I don't want to flag your next. Well, that was going to be. Right now. Yeah. It's going to be I did want to go into that yeah. because it does look like Peter Dutton is setting up to have immigration as a pretty large part heading into the. Like I said, there is a bit of a death spiral there with Labor at times, um, and you would think, and perhaps this is facile, that with such large proportions of migrants and second generations and third, that wouldn't fly. But that's not quite true, is it? Like the no, it's not the, true. the the migrants might be a bit against migration. I think they might be. Um, I think it's possible to convince them to be against, not necessarily their own tribe, but the idea that they got here when the country was still working, they got here the right way, but this mad Labor government has just taken the lid off it and then too many have coming at once. So that's, you, can, you, can, you can play that card to pretty much any, any Australian and they'll go, oh yeah, I see some sense in that. There's a detail, there's a detail of the migration debate which Peter Dutton would be aware of, but of course he doesn't need to acknowledge it because why spoil a good scare campaign? The decision to take the cap 
the sort of the job, the hours that students could work uh, was taken by Morrison. When they reopened the economy after 2022, they were afraid that we were going to have labour shortages when we reopened. And that half a million net migration number that you keep being bandied about is a consequence of, of a decision to have uncontrolled migration um, from the anti-migration party. And of course, to them, uh, well, we didn't do it because we got kicked out. So how could we have done it? And the Labor Party have inherited this mess and have spent the last couple of years trying to figure out what to do with it. And obviously with the universities, they may have, they may have slammed the brake a bit too hard with the cap on international students. And the coalition, of course, are now laughing, literally laughing their heads off because Labor are trying to, are trying to correct for pro-migration policies of the coalition government, which no one in Australia thinks that the coalition actually is responsible for. And the coalition is saying, you're not going hard enough, but hang on a minute, we're fixing your mess. It's, it's actually, it's quite amusing if it wasn't so serious, but it is quite amusing. Um, and ob obviously once the economy reopens, you've also got an inflation shock. So you don't even need to be brutal about your anti-immigration card. You're playing a cost of living card and your cost of living card is a congestion card, it's a housing shortage card, it's why would you bring in half a million people when we've got a cost of living crisis? Well, the answer's a bit more complicated than that. If you, if you stopped at cold dead, which is what the rhetoric suggests, and you get your labour shortages, which constituent gets hurt first by the absence of migrants? It's rural and regional Australia, which is coalition stronghold. In fact, you would not wish this on your, your ageing and your poorer communities that they, you couldn't service them. You just would not wish this on these communities. It's also harder to build houses if you're not bringing in some of the construction workers. Well, if you think about, if you think about your aged care labour force and your construction labour force, which male and female, labor, female, and male labour forces, and, and, and uh, there's already a shortage of labour supply within the existing population, old Australians, migrants and their kids, right, the existing and Indigenous, there's an ex existing labour shortage. It doesn't mean that the, the, because there's a shortage, it doesn't mean that people say, well, I don't want my nursing home staffed today. I accept that it's very, very difficult now of a cost of living crisis and I'll just sort of, you know, maybe skip a couple of shifts. No, that's not the way people think. People expect the Australian government to do things for them. And one of the, one of the reasons why Australia not counting that single quarter when we went negative during lockdown. It's one of the reasons why Australia hasn't had a major recession since the early 1990s, is we're, we're running an open market, but with a decent safety net and also a demand-driven migration program. And we, uh, we still look, when other countries look at us, we still look like the role model. Germans did come here a few years ago for advice on how to run a mass migration program. I'm not making that up because I was involved in some of those conversations with them. This is before they received... Um, the UK had a look at our deportation program. <laughs> well, sorry, there's always the counterfactual, which is the UK, right? So they think, they think, they think Europe is, 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 you know, possibly a going concern, maybe, maybe not. Why don't we vote ourselves out of it, make us weaker and them weaker at the same time and see how that flies? <laughs> and, then, and then we get Trump, who then is going to slap tariffs on all of us just because somebody still hasn't convinced them that a tariff is a cost on your consumer. It's not a tax. <laughs> it's not a tax on a foreigner making things. Do you picture all these people sitting... I mean, this incredible group of people is surrounded in with, you know, is, is Elon Musk going to say, look, in the name of government efficiency, let's not do the tariffs and then we can use some of that money to cut... I mean, I, what do you think? What do you picture people telling Trump when question. he comes up with such com things that are so contradictory to the evidence? So there's somebody, there's somebody in, that, in that room already that's envious of what Musk... Uh, Musk sort of jumping the queue in terms of influence. Mm -hmm. And at some point, that person, whether it's the son or you know, one of the others who've been there forever, whisper into Trump's ear, by the way, you know those electric cars, right? The premise of those electric cars is that climate change is a thing, right? <laughs> if you give this guy too much power, he is not going to be drill, baby, drill. He's going to be making us all buy a battery. And, and the moment of realisation will here we go. He's a globalist, mate. He's a globalist. Oh, is he? <laughs> really? Yeah, he's a globalist, mate. And he won't be paying those tariffs anyway. Anyway, sorry. We, or he'll we be digress. stuffed by the tariffs because he imports so much from China and so then he'll turn on Trump. Anything could happen, I think, is the point we're getting to. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, just going back to the, 
the anti-immigration card. So, you know, before we were doing that, what well, best case, worst case mm. hung parliament looked like. Let's do best case, worst case for the migration card for Peter Dutton. And this is, this is an important thought experiment because at the end of this thought experiment is your sense of where the Australian middle might be, depending on how the card is played. So you're a Queenslander in a state that is still majority old Australian. So uh, migrants and their children uh, are not yet 40% of Queensland. And in Brisbane, they're just under half. Gold Coast, by the way, is majority migrant, but that's uh, because Gold Coast is a younger and a smaller city. Brisbane's two and a half, two and a half million people, a majority old Australian, first, second and third generation. You were born here, as were your parents, as were your grandparents. But obviously in the inner city, gentrification and whiteness doesn't make you a conservative voter necessarily because there are three green seats in the inner city of Brisbane. So you're a Queenslander looking at the electoral map that says there are, there are opportunities in these blood red parts of Sydney and Melbourne where Labor always win, which are, some of them are ex-manufacturing, ex some of them are just ethnically diverse, whatever they are you know, seats that Gough Whitlam and Paul Keating used to hold. All right, we've already lost seats that Malcolm Turnbull and Peter Costello and Josh Frydenberg and John Gorton and Harold Holt and Robert Menzies. We've lost all those seats, right, to the Teals. So why don't we go take some safe Labor seats? And you're thinking as a Queenslander, and I've got a hot button issue, can a Queenslander convince somebody in, in Sydney's West who is either... Uh, uh, Indian heritage or Vietnamese heritage? No, no, just a serious question. Or Arab heritage, Lebanese say, because these, this this, this, these are the actual voters we're talking about that might be able to tip the scale if the lifetime Labor voters then switched, although the Vietnamese tend to be a little more socially conservative and because Malcolm Fraser brought them out, there's a residual liberal loyalty within the Vietnamese community. So would you be able to pull it off if you went really hard and you said, right, I'm going hardcore, the sort of thing that will make sure up my base in Queensland, and you're going to like this too, right? Which is, you can't bring any other member of your family to study at a university. You certainly can't bring your mum or your grandparent, or you can't bring an aunt who wants to work in a nursing home. Um, he's obviously not that, he's obviously not that, um, no politician is that thick, ever. <laughs> so he's not going to go that hard. You say no politician. No politician. No. You find, find me one. Well, Ralph Who'd, Babbitt would probably be that stupid. Would he target the Indian community by telling the Indians that he uh, was not going to let another Indian into Australia and expect their vote? Maybe he might. I don't know. Look, mm -hmm. I haven't had this conversation with him. So that's, so that's, your, that's your sort of, you know, the, the extreme race card is really about making sure that everybody else in Australia knows which group you're picking on because that's how race cards used to work in the past. But it's a very difficult thing to do in a majority migrant electorate. It's very difficult to do because what you're really telling people is, is at some point in the future, your aspiration for your extended family uh, is a problem for me because I can get elected by denying them entry. Mm. But by the way, I'm also asking for your vote. So anyway, so that's, that's the worst case. So his better case scenario is the, is, is the scenario that, you know, what Trump plays at the margin with Hispanic community and even with African-Americans, which is you're all here for the right reasons, but the next one isn't. And it's a they. It's not a you and it's not your family. Mm -hmm. So can he do that? Well, of course, he's, that's what he's thinking about. And he's had the voice uh, to give him an incentive. And he's weirdly, because... Uh, a lot of politicians on both sides, but especially conservative politicians, look at America and think that it's immediately transferable to Australia, which it isn't for a number of reasons. Um, but of course, Labor people do the same thing. After Obama wins in 2008, pretty much every second person that was remotely associated with the Obama campaign came down to Australia to advise the Labor Party about how to do it, even though they'd already won an election. And of course, they they lost the majority at their next election, so none of that advice seemed to, uh, seemed to work too well for them at the time. So, yeah, there is, there is a bad way and a good way to play this card. So what will be the consequences of him playing it well and the Labor Party falling into a minority, even finishing second in the dance? So the Coalition have more seats than the Labor Party and the Labor Party have lost Heartland seats in the outer suburbs. 
and they're ethnically diverse electorates. So you know everybody will be writing the story in the same way because they'll just sort of look at the top line, which is, you know, migrant electorates move from Labor to either Liberal or a, what I call a Brown, and I do this in the, with love, as olive skin myself, a Brown independent, like more Dilees. So if that happened at the next election, you'd be saying to the Labor Party, well, first thing you'd say to the Liberal Party is congratulations, you, you've played a mass migration, an anti-migration card and got, and got a bump in migrant communities. You'd also say to the Labor Party, well, for the last 30 odd years where you're looking at the inner city having your little turf wars with the Greens, which is essentially a white on white, red on green contest between gentrified members of the political class mm -hmm. And out there, where real Australia is, with the engine room of small business and the engine room of our, our, sort of, our sort of better educated cohorts is, and you haven't bothered to look there and ask them what they might want from you, because uh, they've voted for you the last 15 times anyway, um, it would be a... Look, what would you wish on the country? You'd wish a scare for the major parties that becomes more visceral than just a third, a third, a third, which is that no seat is safe. You would wish that on them. And then the next step, once you've wished that on them, is for them to first go back to their base and not think base means my party room. Mm. Base means I may actually have to go out there where I haven't campaigned at all because it's been a safe seat with a 20% margin for as long as I've been in the system. You actually have to go back out there and have a look at it. And also think about the thing, I mean, I talk about it this a lot, because the change in Australia's population in the last 15 years has made everywhere different all at once. And it's done this because we've hit that tipping point where the boomers are starting to exit the labour market. First, the boomers reached 65 in 2011. We come out of the GFC, we've had a deep recession, and we get huge surge in migration around about the same time push and pull factors, but essentially the rest of the world is projecting onto us safe haven status, and we're getting many more migrants than either side of politics, and a lot of them are pretty well educated. Obviously, the tertiary sector has built a, has built a revenue model around them. Um, but because this, is, this became automatically a normal thing and both sides agreed to it, because you wouldn't wish a recession on your country, because how do you get a second term with a recession? Um, You've had, you've had the thing that hasn't been noticed in the political system, which is the cities themselves are starting to move in completely different directions. So when I talk about the inner city of Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne looking more alike than even the rest of their respective cities. So across that band, this is why the Greens, the Greens vote sort of taps out about 10 k's out of the CBD in each of those three. But it's a geographically concentrated vote uh, around younger voters. Mm -hmm. And it's a vote that can get you a seat without you knowing who the leader is of the party. So it's not a personality-based party like a Hanson or a, or a Palmer party. Um, it, is, it is an idea of a party which appeals to a certain segment of the Australian electorate which is concentrating in election winning, in seat deciding numbers at one point. The Teal is a completely different phenomenon. Suddenly you get people with a life out of politics who are instantly recognisable to their constituents as the sorts of people you would send to Parliament to fix that joint, not to wreck it, but to fix it. But within the, within the diversity in the cities, uh, it's not that one size doesn't fit all now in campaigning purposes, it's because everywhere is different within the cities and the cities themselves are different to the, to the rest of state and then each of the capitals are different to one another. And how do you measure this? Up until 2011 census, didn't matter where you looked, the first and the second largest overseas-born groups in a capital city or a town tended to be the same. Then it would have been the English uh, with the Kiwis at number two. In the intervening 10 years, was a huge decade of diversity. The Chinese have risen to number one in Sydney, and the Indians are number two. The Indians are number one and the Chinese are number two in Melbourne. The Indians are number one in Canberra. English are still number one here, but the Indians are number two. The English are still number one in Perth and in Hobart. Migrants from the Philippines are number one in Darwin, and migrants from New Zealand are number one in, um, in, in Brisbane and on the Gold Coast. So just, just, thinking, just thinking about the diversity of each of these cities, as a, as a national political party, if you don't empower your local members and you don't get intel on the ground each time, I, if you don't have a representative party, you bug it anyway. Because you, you, you will get the sort of shock that... Um, 
that Morrison got at the last election. By the way, Morrison's shock, would, let's get really ethnically specific. They did two things during lockdown which was guaranteed to destroy them in the outer suburbs, which the ones that Dutton are targeting now. One, Peter Dutton himself, as I alluded to earlier, told Australians on Anzac Day just before the 2022 election to prepare for war for, with China. So the 1.4 million Australians of Chinese ancestry goes, mate, you are a moron. I think, <laughs> I think it went you out of WeChat me. pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> He's, he, look, he did work this out very quickly. He's much more pragmatic than Steve. It's still a dumb thing to say. But the dumbest thing that was done in that term of government was that crazy week when the Morrison government panicked and threatened jail for anyone who came to Australia from India during the Delta outbreak. Do you remember that? Just one, it didn't matter who you were and it didn't matter what your circumstance were and they issued a press release with, with prison as the warning and in one of the interviews somebody said, why is there any of the lock-up Australians wanting to come home where there isn't COVID, where there is COVID from where they're coming? Uh, he said, no, no, there's no penal sanctions, blah, blah, blah. He said, it's in your press release. <laughs> and then he pretended he hadn't written the press release. Um, the health minister had written it, yeah. even though he was also the health minister at the time, yeah. which we didn't know yeah. <laughs> at the time. <laughs> so, yeah. Race card, it's very difficult to be specific with a race card against a minority group on behalf of the rest of the country. You know, asylum seekers. Uh, in, back in the day when Paul and Hans thought you could be specific about Asians when they were outnumbered by pretty much every other ethnic group. Can't do that now. Um, it's going to be more difficult, especially when you're looking at diversity across each of those capitals. Because I can guarantee you pretty much everyone in Australia, even though we all don't like our identity politics, will log an insult, whether it's women during, during the Brittany Higgins matter, whether it's, um, whether it's Indians during the Delta panic. As a childless cat lady, I always log the insult. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you wanted to vote for the insult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, there is, um, there is complexity in the electorate, and it, but it's complexity that's happened so quickly. It doesn't just coincide with the breakdown of the duopoly. It's one of the things that explains it, and you can make more sense of the breakdown of the duopoly when you, when you get your head around the idea that everywhere is different, but the parties are still thinking about an electorate where they're only competing for 10 of the 20% that don't vote for them, and that 10% have all got a mortgage. George, we are running out of time, Sorry terrifyingly quickly. So I have just done something rash. I've conflated... Let's ask some more questions. From, can we ask more questions from the audience? That yes. You've already had what I've done yeah. is I have conflated a bunch of the questions together because I think Sorry. we only have time for one more. So we got great questions from the audience people. That's why I started off with one. I looked at it and went, oh, it's embarrassing. They're a bit better than the ones I've written. They're better anyway, than yours. <laughs> <laughs> there does seem to be a theme, though. So I'm going to consolidate the questions from the audience with a couple of things that I wanted to ask about. And I might be trying a bit too hard to blend these things here. There's pragmatism and then there's ideology. How does that play out and can, will that play out in a healthier way in a hung parliament? And does the way that play out, could that restore trust in our parliament? It's a big one, you've got five minutes. Yeah, and it does go back, <laughs> I'll try and think about, because I grew up on a tabloid, so we've taught to re, uh, write really, really short paragraphs. And within the first three paragraphs, there had to be a quote to prove that you talked to somebody. Remember that old rule? <laughs> Maybe it wasn't. I grew up on the Melbourne Sun. That was our rule. That was our rule of the Sun. Um, when you when you think about when you think about what uh, when does self interest and ideology coalesce, mm. and it does when your numbers are so small that sorry it, it will it will coalesce at the point at which you've chosen the path of least demographic resistance in the short term. So you're Labor and you're only going to the cities and you're forgetting the regions. You're coalition and you're just going to hold your numbers in the cities and try and pinch a couple in the outer suburbs. You're Green and you're only going to talk to your people. I'll just add the Greens into it. Mm. I won't put the Teals into it because the Teals do feel a little more, a little more, uh, uh, a little more balanced, let's say, mm. than the than the three and a half parties we've got at the moment. Um, so. When it's not possible to form a majority government, when the penny drops, if it's not next election or the election after, for both those parties, right? When it's not possible to form a majority government, you're doing, you need to do two things at once. once. One, you need to engage the crossbench just to form a minority government. Mm -hmm. But two, you have to start thinking about what it is that isn't connecting in those seats for you. 
And if the Teals, for example, are telling, you, are telling the coalition to, to come back to planet normal on climate change, or the Teals are telling the Labor Party to get off your backside and do tax reform, and the Greens, notwithstanding some of the ideology, seems like more performative ideology than practical mm -hmm. suggestions for policy, uh, that the housing crisis is a real and present danger to, um, to social cohesion, and there's a generational rip-off going on here. Think about the younger voter properly. Like if if that's what the it's, if that's what it takes to restore the major parties to thinking in a policy sense, which will require them to think ideologically, but morally as well, then I'm all for that. But the other part to it is, and this is the this is between I, there's another part to ideology, and that is when the path of least demographic resistance. And understand what I'm talking about, least demographic resistance. There are still seats um, for a coalition party room that's wider than the nation at large, and it will always be white. Now that party can convince itself that the rest of the country looks like them. The same thing can happen to the Labor Party that's 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 sort of headquartered in the cities and a couple of provincial towns. It can convince itself, as the Democrats obviously did in the US at the last um, uh, presidential election, that the entire country is cosmopolitan and is and is and is ready to uh, embrace a new, a new utopian identity. I mean, that is I, for me that's the bigger problem. The bigger problem at the moment is that the two parties, the two parties are separating along. Uh, tribal organisations in the first place, but, but are going to intuitively separate demographically because that's the easiest thing for them to do, whether the majority actually is in building the bridge for two. The next majority government, and this is where we come back to the sort of the sense of some of these questions, in a way you're looking as, at a hung parliament as the halfway house to somebody showing you what a new majority looks like. Mm. And then that's ultimately, like ultimately, I think I wouldn't mind seeing the jobly work properly again and be good competitive jobly. Um, that's ultimately what you would be looking for. You'd be looking for one of them go, it's not working for me at a third of the, uh, the, third of the population. It's certainly not working for me thinking by place in a city or outer suburbs or regions. It's not working for me. The other thing is I've got now a real problem, which is all the winners of deregulation and all the winners of our mass migration program are concentrated in the cities and they're paying taxes mm -hmm. and all the recipients of welfare are in the regions. And at some point, uh, you don't want to break that social bond between them because this is a different challenge to you know, a more sort of ethnically predictable Australia where everywhere looks the same, even if it's more diverse in some areas than others. Uh, this is a more difficult problem for you if you've got huge skill migration program, people land with not necessarily an intention to stay if they can be cherry picked by another country, Canada, for example, or New Zealand, or, you know, some mythical restoration of a progressive US administration. <laughs> um, so you've got, you've got the, the sort of hunt for talent. So you've got that problem, but they're taxpayers as well. So you're going to have to be bidding their taxes down. And at the same time, you've got constituencies that you want them to get along with your taxpayer because you want to be able to fund their services. I, you know, I think this, the cohesion equation, people talk about cohesion in different ways. For me, the budget is, is almost your simplest product um, that tells you whether you are or aren't running a cohesive Australia because Australians want a, a, a viable safety net. But again, the conversation is going to be changing in around who's paying taxes and who's receiving because if it's predominantly older, wider Australians, and the taxpayers are predominantly younger, better educated, either migrants or, or gentrified Australians, they're not talking to each other. And they won't be talking to each other in a third, a third, a third political system. So in the long run, I don't want to see a run of hung parliaments, if that's a, uh, if I've just contradicted my thesis. <laughs> Again, no, what I'm talking there about is a surprise twist and ending, but you're just going to have to buy the quarterly essay to find out what it is. You haven't heard it all yet, folks, and we barely got through I'm anything. sorry about the long answers, Not but at all. they're good stories, I think. All of that was Here fascinating. And I've got to say, I read as I was reading the quarterly essay, I felt stupid because of so many things in there that I hadn't thought about didn't know in the first place or had entirely forgotten, but then by the time I'd finished it and absorbed it, I felt a bit smarter. So it's, it's definitely worth the outlay. And we've got some, and we've got some the science. The reader is never wrong. Isn't that right? <laughs> is that a thing they say? Well, the consumer's never wrong and the ABC audience is never wrong. Bring, sure. back, bring back my good friend Sarah McDonald, we'll if anybody's listening on that podcast, because I know the ABC are... Uh, 
uh, broadcasting this. So if I'm allowed to keep that in, please keep it in. <laughs> With no, no comment passed on management, but she's a gun and she should be on your team. Very smoothly done, George Megalogenis. Well done. All right, so thanks everyone again for coming. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>